Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I'm here today for another this and that. And for those who are new, it is simply a weekly vlog. I try to do it weekly anyway, just talking about the different things I have going on around here currently, updating you on projects, leading you back to some other videos I may already have out that are in-depth videos on specific topics that I'm doing and so on. So let's get to the topics of today. I'm going to start off talking about herbs in several different ways. So first thing is the things that are dehydrating this week well it's a lot and actually today especially is going to be a lot because we've had the whole last week mostly was very stormy and wet typical forks weather in spring and you know we do have this a lot of this back and forth and so i didn't run my dehydrators a lot i was intentionally not harvesting a lot of stuff because I didn't want to put strain on our battery bank since we weren't getting a ton of solar power collection during the dark stormy days. But today is a beautiful day and so I might actually have three dehydrators running today. I have a very full one out there right now. When it's a warm day I do the dehydrating outside. What I have going on right here currently is the oregano I still have yet to put on the trays and then here is more catnip I've been dehydrating a little bit of catnip but now I'm gonna I've decided I'm gonna dehydrate a lot more than I normally do because I think I'm going to be using it a lot more than I usually do through, through the year and I'll explain why in just a bit and then here's a list I wrote down of some other things I have been dehydrating so one of those things is the golden oregano I love golden oregano now I did a video just on oregano and its benefits plus the two types that I grow and one is your standard Mediterranean oregano and then the other is the golden oregano and I love them both for two different reasons and so I recommend you go check out that video but I know a lot of people are having a hard time finding golden oregano that have been hearing me talk about it for years I have never got seed from my golden oregano and I think it's because I keep it harvested back because I dry a lot to get me through the year plus I use a lot of it fresh it is so good it's not hot like your Mediterranean oregano so it's something that's really great to use fresh in salads and plus it adds that beautiful very bright greenish yellow color to the salads as well as a wonderful flavor and then of course as you know I've already been doing the comfrey and the peppermint but a couple other new things that I've added since my last video are, have been calendula now these are only the calendula flowers from last year's plants that didn't die back from the winter so they're starting to put out a lot of flowers now but my Calendula I just started this year is uh, some of it I got a couple plants that are this big now But they got a ways to go before they start putting out flowers most of them There are only about this tall still especially with this recent Past week of very cold weather and then I just started harvesting the red clover flowers it finally started blooming and the plantain so lots of plantain out there and a it's all growing wild right now and I I have to really work at keeping it out of the main garden areas as much as I can and still having a good clean place for it you know unlike in the yard where it easily grows wild there too the having some in the garden is nice because the leaves will get bigger and much healthier same applies to your dandelion you can get some pretty massive dandelion leaves which oh that's the other thing I need to start harvesting my flowers have slowed down quite a bit but now it's putting all the energy into making those massive leaves and so I need to start dehydrating those up too oh and I think I forgot to mention the sage so sage is another one I just started getting that so I like to every year even if I have a lot of sage from previous years I always like to make sure I have at least one fresh jar from the current year because they when it comes to your culinary herbs especially you're just going to have a lot better flavor if you can use those up within a year and the other herbs can be used for making teas and stuff but if you're really looking at just putting a pinch or two into something and to get that flavor the freshest herbs you can use the better so let me come back to the catnip uh, one of the things i use catnip in is pain relief both in the one i make for the dog and the one that i make for us 
Now, even though catnip isn't considered a pain reliever per se, one of the ways it works, and this is why I also use it in combination with other herbs if I'm trying to treat pain in particular, such as catnip with feverfew and valerian leaf is a real excellent blend. But the catnip is a mild sedative. A catnip tea, especially if it's made with fresh catnip, is it's okay. It's got a decent flavor. It's not my very favorite, but I'll drink it. But combined with, I found recently with some mojito mint, makes a really nice flavor. Now, mojito mint is usually not my favorite for making tea with, but if it's blended with certain other things, it does take on a nice flavor. And it's not because I don't like the flavor of it. It's just, it's not as strong as peppermint. When I'm thinking tea, mint tea, I want it strong. And I love peppermint tea. But for something like what I'm making this tea for, it, it is nice having that particular flavor and that blend. Let me explain why I'm doing this. Now, I'm sure if anyone's really been paying attention to a lot of my more recent videos, including maybe last week's this and that video, um, you might have noticed that I'm just getting a lot more stressed out. Things have been, it's not that life is bad. Things are great. There's a lot of great things going on, but it's a lot of things. So stress can, uh, can come to us in many different forms. Now, while most of the stress that's going on in my life right now is all good positive things, even positive things can bring on a lot of stress. You know, there is still some negative and thankfully it's all more tame stuff such as things like the trolls coming out of the dank, dark recesses of their mama's basement to come in and make rude comments on my video and tell me what I should and shouldn't talk about. and I shouldn't talk about God and blah, 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 and tell me why I'm wrong, whatever. Delete, delete, delete. Most of the time, that's what I do. Though sometimes I get a little snarky and just feel like I have to say something. With all of that, with all these different things that keep coming up and, you know, and then of course watching the ground baby three days a week is a joy. I love it, but it's another thing that keeps me busy all the time or means I have to put other projects on hold because he needs my attention, which I'm happy to give it to him. As a result, I'm starting to see more recently specifically, it's taken a toll on my health in several different ways. And I'm not gonna go into all the details about that. I'm one that's very independent. I wanna take care of the problem myself if I can. And I'm positive it is just all this extra stuff that keeps being put on me. So let's come back to the catnip. Now catnip for dogs and for humans is a mild sedative. Now we know that valerian root and leaves are have very strong sedative properties, especially the root. And it is great, and I will use that from time to time too. However, valerian is one of those herbs that you got to be careful not to become dependent on it. I don't think it's necessarily addictive. You just don't want to be dependent on it and taking it every single day. And so, and I think for the most part, that it can that can apply to almost all of your medicinal herbs. I think it's a very good idea to always find a balance. And so. I've been turning more to the catnip tea because though it's a much more mild sedative, it is very helpful, especially for me in this situation. So if I can make some catnip tea and sip on that through the day, I find it very calming to my nerves. If you're going through a lot of stress, anxiety, or whatever, then I recommend the catnip tea for that. And I still recommend valerian. I just again if you're if it's a daily thing you're having to take care of like right now i'm having to do i don't recommend doing the valerian every day that's just my personal recommendation now as i always say you need to do the research for your own self and find out what's best for you make sure you're looking to see if these herbs are safe for whatever your health condition may be whatever medications you may be on or your allergies and so on i try to say that every time i don't always remember but just always keep that in the front of your mind whether it be me or someone who's been a licensed certified herbalist for 50 years you should still Listen, obviously listen to what they say and glean the information, but when it comes to your own personal self, you still need to do your own research and 
start in small amounts to make sure it's going to be safe for you because not everything I do is going to be best for you. Now let's come back to the mojito mint. Now I picked a lot of mojito mint here. I don't need this much fresh mint for a pot of tea today. I need to make some more cleaning vinegar. I have some going back here that's on a tail end. It's mango peel and, and orange peel. Thankfully all that's organic, but still my purpose of that one is for cleaning vinegar. But I'm going to be making more because I use the cleaning vinegar quite a bit and I use it in the laundry all the time, especially now. And I'll be talking about that in probably a future video in regards to soap and your laundry and so on. But it is an excellent addition to the laundry and it's cheap you know, it's when you make it yourself, especially if you can use excess from your garden. Now, if you're new to my channel or new to making vinegars, I make vinegars out of just about anything. You can make vinegars out of just about anything. It does not have to be apples. It doesn't even have to be fruit. It can be herbs. It can be vegetables. It can be whatever sounds good. But if you're making your vinegars out of anything that is not already high in natural sugars, like your apples, your mangoes, and so on, then you're going to need to add a little more sugar to it. Now, I'm going to link to probably a couple different vinegar making videos down below. I'll link to the last one on specifically making a fruit vinegar where I go into quite a bit of detail, not just on making that vinegar, but others. And I'll also link to the video I did on how much sugar for your vinegar uh, that was specifically answering that question. And I'll put that down below too. Okay, so the next thing, and I was here, and this is kind of funny. So I got a lot of rhubarb, lots of rhubarb, as you know, coming in just from two plants, tons of rhubarb this year, the most I've ever gotten. Some people were asking me if I'd be willing to sell it. Well, initially I was saying, no, I'm not going to sell it because I, I just can't even fathom trying to think of having to pack it up and ship it. But then the more, and then I thought, well, no, I could do that because I've got lots of ice packs and insulation from my Misfits Markets orders and other orders I've done when I've or where I've ordered cheese or butter from certain places. But then I started thinking about it again. And if you've never grown rhubarb before, or you're new at growing rhubarb, you never want to over harvest your rhubarb. So that means you don't want to take too many stalks out at a time, or you could actually damage the tap root to your rhubarb and may not get any next year. So I try to be very careful. Right now what I'm doing, because it's coming in pretty fast and it's growing really well, is about every three to four days going out and taking three to four stalks per plant. And that's because my plants are very big. If your plants are on the smaller side, I don't recommend taking more than two stalks per plant. That's just me. Now there might be a chart out there that you can find. I've never read anything about how much you should harvest at a time. I've just fallen my own guidelines and kind of looking at the plant and studying it and just knowing what I feel like I can take out safely. Anyway, because of that, I would not be able to keep up with the orders people would be putting in for the rhubarb without damaging my plant. Also, I had an idea that kind of came to me and that was uh, making rhubarb wine, which is something I've never done. I've put rhubarb slices into mead to add a rhubarb flavor just to kind of infuse it. But I'm talking about actually making a rhubarb juice, juicing the rhubarb. And I was wondering, well, how do other people do it? I have some ideas, but how do other people do it? And I did a little look and and I figured some people probably cooked their rhubarb down, which I didn't want to do. I want to keep it as fresh as possible or raw as possible, I should say. And one lady, I came across her blog and she, what she does is she takes her rhubarb, she puts it in half gallon or whole gallon jars, actually. She puts it in whole gallon jars, chops it up and then puts a whole bunch of sugar over it, covers it and then lets it sit for a few days. Just like salt does with other things, sugar can pull the liquids, the juices out of your different fruits and vegetables. And so that's how she did it. And I thought, well, I really like that idea. My initial idea was to freeze the rhubarb for two reasons. One, because freezing does really good at helping to pull the juices out once you go to thaw it and it softens the rhubarb quite a bit. But that also gives me an opportunity to only harvest a little bit at a time, chop it up, and then put it in the freezer. So I'm using a combination. So what I've been doing is um, I'm actually using these bags here. These aren't the silicone ones. These are the ones I thought were silicone when I bought them and then found out later they're not. However, as much as I love and still highly recommend these, I like these bags generally better than these ones. This one 
in this pack, I got bigger bags. So especially since it's not something I'm leaving in the freezer for a long period of time, these are actually perfect for that. So I've been packing bags like this full of the chopped up rhubarb and then sprinkling a little sugar each time I put another layer and then put it in the freezer. And then when I need to chop up more, I put more in there, sprinkle a little more sugar over, put it back in the freezer. And once I get enough to make a gallon of wine, I'm going to go ahead and pull all that out, let it thaw and juice it. And then if I find I don't have enough juice, well, I have strawberries in the freezer from last year. And I'm thinking about doing, pulling those out and then just juicing those and adding the strawberry juice to the rhubarb juice to make a strawberry rhubarb wine. I think that would be a really good option. I almost always have some kind of wine going because I use it for many different things. A lot of people think you make wine just to drink it. Well, no. Wine has many, many other purposes. And I did a video just on that, the many uses of homemade wine. And I use a lot for marinating and for sauteing. I love to do that. And many other cooking things that you can use it in. So go ahead and check out that video if you're curious, because even if you don't drink, I think you should still at least learn the process. And it's also good for making both medicinal extracts and extracts for flavoring. Now let's come back to these bags real quick. One of the things I found too about this particular bag, and now I did get these on Amazon. They are BPA free, food safe, and so on and so forth. And one of the things I do like about this set are the size of the bags. So I mentioned this bigger one here, and then there's also these two. Now the silicone bags I have, I have them some in this size. And so I, I'll still use these because they're here, but then this smaller size is really nice, especially when I'm wanting to chop up just some carrots, put them in there and have enough for adding to a meal. And it's been working great for that. But the thing I recently discovered was this size is perfect, absolutely perfect for putting my homemade tortillas in. So last week I had made some carne asada and yes, I did actually shoot a video about that that I still got to edit and put together and it will probably be about a month out before you see it. But you know, whenever I make carne asada or if I'm making enchiladas or I'm making tacos or whatever, I make my own homemade tortillas. I do have an old video, it's old, but I still do the process the same that I'll link to down below on making your own homemade tortillas and found that this is actually the perfect size for putting the tortillas in that will keep them from drying out and I can keep reusing it over and over again. Now about the silicone bags, I keep saying I'm going to do a separate video just on these and I may still at some point, but I'm going to go ahead and do a quick update. Loving these things. I've been using them more and more all the time. Now I get these from a lady here in the United States. She has her own online store that I have linked to down below. And I'm going to be doing another order here soon because the more I use these silicone bags, the more I love them. So not only am I using them in the freezer, which I find they do actually do better in the freezer than these bags here for a longer period of time anyway. For short term, this is fine. But for things you want to keep in there longer, I do recommend the silicone, but I use these in the refrigerator too. So especially with the Misfits Market stuff coming in, um, I use one like this for putting the carrots in. I use one for putting when I cut into an onion. I like to have something to put it in. I have a lot of great glass containers, but sometimes I either don't have enough or they can take up too much room where these you can uh, kind of fold them up, bend them around and fit them into other places that you might not be able to fit the glass containers. They both have their benefits. The glass containers are stackable. The snap locks love those things, but I like these that I can also shove these in the, in the produce drawers too. And they work really good for me. So again, how these work is you, you have this little tab here instead of it being a Ziploc, you have the the bar that slides on there now people had asked me does that hold liquid well i never would have thought of freezing liquid in something like this or storing liquid in a bag i got this a little bit too full but i just filled it up with water so once you have it filled up with water once you have this top on here it can kind of stand up on its own not super great but if you can prop it up in such a way that it's not gonna fall over and you're gonna freeze in it. And like I said, I, I think I got this too full. You wouldn't wanna fill it this full if you're gonna freeze in it. 
uh, because you want to le leave room for the liquid to expand and you don't want to tear your silicone. Now, personally, I wouldn't do this. I would still freeze my liquids in jars like I always do, and I have a video on that too. But I think if you were to stand it up and let it freeze, then you could put it anywhere if you had a way of propping it up. It sort of stands up on its own, but not, not super great. Okay, so let me go ahead and turn it upside down so you can see. I've got it turned upside down. I'm actually not seeing it drip at all. I'm turning it sideways, not totally upside down. I'm kind of afraid to turn it completely upside down. I don't want the pressure to blow out. There we go. I got a little drip there. It could be coming from the outside of the bag too. But anyway, for anything else, I think they're great. I love them. And you can check out that link down below. And for those who are curious, the reason we would do something like the silicone are these. These are a lot cheaper than these are, but these are definitely better made. And the reason for that is just to free yourself from having to buy Ziploc bags or uh, saran wrap or anything like that where you're constantly having to go through plastic that you're just going to turn around and throw away. Because we know uh, those plastic Ziploc type bags don't a lot of them, especially if you're freezing in them, even if they're freezer bags, a lot of them only last through one freezing and then they get holes in them. Yes, you're going to pay a lot more money, but you should they should last for a very, very long time. And again, so far, I'm very happy with them and using them a lot more. And hopefully next week, I'll try to focus more on doing a garden update, but things are doing good. The grapevines are growing. I'm starting to see little grape buds forming. My, my berries are going crazy. My lettuces are doing great. My beans are doing great. Okay, well, hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.